Hey everyone. In the year of our Lord 2021, science can figure out a lot, but it can't figure out which is the best TV show about a previously rich family. To figure this out, we need to go beyond science, beyond good and evil, and into the deep, dark realm of video essays. This gladiator face-off will be judged by you, the viewers. If you decide Arrested Development is better, please like this video. And if you decide that Shit's Creek is better, then please like this video and also subscribe. This may not be a perfect means of measurement, but it will help in a way. Superficially, these shows have a lot in common. We meet both the Bluths and the Roses as their lives of wealth collapse around them. The Bluths' fall from grace seems to have been quite a long time coming, and was caused by the actions of the two heads of the family. Lucille and George Sr., as they committed various types of fraud in running their company. On the other hand, the Rose family's fall from grace was quite abrupt, and was through the fault of their accountant rather than through their own wrongdoing. This difference may be small, but I think the fact that the Bluths are essentially guilty and the Roses aren't sets the stage for shows with entirely different ambitions. A superficial difference, and superficial is a word that comes to mind a lot in looking at these shows, is that the Bluth family is much larger than the Rose family. This corresponds with another and less superficial difference, which is that the Rose family is not only smaller, but clearly more intimate. Like, I know people throw around the word dysfunctional, but I think we have to admit that the Bluths are a little bit more dysfunctional. Or a lot. Many more episodes of Shit's Creek end with the Rose family hugging or connecting in some way than episodes of Arrested Development do. Like, the entire season 4 of Arrested Development ends on the apparently triumphant moment of George Michael punching his dad in the face. Because he finds out his dad was lying to him about dating George Michael's ex. So yeah, not my definition of intimate. But that doesn't mean you have to like them less. It may make you like them more. And it might not change at all how much you like the show, because so far we've only talked about the families, and the family is not the show. The first huge difference between these shows is that Arrested Development has a narrator. Famous redhead child actor and movie producer Ron Howard narrates all 84 episodes of the show. And his narration has become famous where people say, it wasn't, or he didn't, or something like that, like a narrator in response to something someone else says. Why did Ron Howard spawn this meme rather than any of the other countless narrators throughout time and space? I think it's an interesting question, and I think the answer is most narrators aren't that involved in the show to where they're responding even to the dialogue of the characters. I'm sure some narrators have done this before, but have any of them ever been quite so up in the guts of the show they narrate as Ron Howard is in Arrested Development? Oh, I'm getting chills. If this was a lifetime moment of truth movie, this would be our act break. But it wasn't. And later... Boy, you sure got this whole dug out quick. In fact, the laborer had been hired by George Sr. three days earlier for the same hole. But let's hear the guy himself talk about his thoughts on his narration. I actually borrowed from National Geographic. Uh, because I, I thought that when, when we knew we were going to have a narrator for the Bluth family, um, I, I thought it should be approached with a, a kind of a sociological or an anthropological um, uh, mindset from, from, uh, in terms of the, the phrasing and, and, and uh, the approach. I think this is the same narrator who, you know, would, would be doing, um, you know, something about the uh, indigenous uh, inhabitants of the Amazon basin. Uh, and then their next job would be to come and talk about the Booth family. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Another big difference is the camera work. Arrested Development uses handheld camera work, which adds an instability and fast-paced energy that emphasizes the dysfunctional nature of the family, and even, really, the dysfunctional nature of the show itself. Which is to say, compared to Shit's Creek, and compared to most shows, Arrested Development's plot is far more convoluted. This is why even if you find narrators annoying, you'll probably agree that Ron's ever-present voice is pretty helpful, a lot of the time at least. This show's plot involves Shakespearean levels of duplicitous characters lying to each other, plus a whole murder mystery that connects with financial maneuverings and betrayal and all that. The plot of Schitt's Creek is vastly more straightforward. They've already lost their wealth, and they're adjusting to how the other half lives, so to speak. 
Living as the 99%, staying in a dingy motel, and living in a town that despite the fact that they technically own it, they have little control over it. It's a classic Phoenix story of rebirth. Are you kidding me? I'm a, I'm a Phoenix. Sure, there are complexities. For instance, the various family members occasionally striving to leave the town. And there are hookups, breakups, makeups, and all kinds of ups and downs. But even the subplots are relatively simple. Not simple in a bad way, but simple in a way that's easy to remember and connect to. Like Moira running for city council rather than Lucille on trial for what again? What? What is she on trial for? Was that from last season? If you're watching this and thinking, wow, this guy sounds stupid, he can't even follow a show. You may be right, but I don't think this is all on me. As one article puts it about Arrested, its complex plots have become so tangled and knotty that they basically require a doctorate to follow. And I only have a master's, so I can't be expected to understand this. Another article refers to tangled, absurd narrative arcs, and some episodes ending up clunky and overstuffed. Comedian and actor David Cross, who of course plays Tobias Funke, said in 2012 to Rolling Stone that the show's fourth season makes Lost look like a Spalding Gray monologue. A reference I don't understand since I don't know anything about Spalding Gray, but I'm assuming it supports my point since Lost is probably a very complicated show, I think. And then there are articles like this one which takes issue with people who find the show too complicated. I'll share a quote since this may resonate for people voting for Arrested Development as the superior show. The article says about season 4, It is more complicated and ambitious than the stuff that came before it, but that only makes the payoff which comes more in the unfolding rather than from a big moment more satisfying and impressive. Perhaps there's a lot to laugh at in season 4, like the running joke of Job disassociating to the song The Sound of Silence. Because you know I'm out of the family. Did you not get that when I announced I'm over at mom's place? I feel like I was out of the room at that point. I am done with this family. I hope you've saved some money. Cause Hello, darkness, my old friend. Well, the gist of it was, you know what? I'm done with this family. I hope you It needs to be briefly mentioned that season four was when the show returned in 2013 after being canceled by Fox all the way back in 2006. And the show came out on Netflix as a quote unquote Netflix semi-original series. The season was extremely hard for creator Mitchell Hurwitz to write because apparently all the actors were too famous to be available at the same time. This accounts for part of the heightened mania and convolutions of later seasons. I also think the show tried to embrace the idea of being past its prime by having characters like Job be in a complete meltdown identity crisis downward spiral type of thing. In season 5 he moves on to being completely off the rails in terms of sense of self, and I feel like he just sort of represents the exhausted state of the show's creators as they try to function in such a changed production environment. Maybe that's a stretch, but oh boy his protracted meltdown is something else. Well, when I was a kid, you said you want a trophy, try harder, Joe. Huh, well, maybe I did something right, huh? But I was like, but you gave one to everybody else. What happened to everybody gets a trophy? Because there was a little bit of that back then. It was just getting started, but meanwhile. A big difference between these two shows that may help your final decision is that they don't both care the same amount about character development. Anyone saying Arrested Development has character development was watching a different show. I mean, look at the title of the show, Arrested Development. It really fits. Michael develops to some extent by finally separating himself and George Michael from his family, which in the context of the show is development because of the running joke where he leaves. We're going to Phoenix. Oh, I wish you hadn't said that. And then comes back. Oh, he'll be back. <laughs> Michael always comes back. Oh, he'll be back. Especially after something goes horribly wrong based on something stupid we did. And I mean, this guy, he'll be, God. We're happy Michael escaped, but pretty unfulfilled if we went in wanting to see other characters grow too. Like wouldn't it maybe have been nice if some of the other Bluths improved enough so that Michael and George Michael didn't need to cut ties? But of course, it's fine that Arrested doesn't show characters genuinely improve. That's not the show. The show is a series of people doing things wrong, getting caught, lying about it, and admitting it. There's always reconciliation, and the show always uses actually the same song over all the reconciliation scenes, so we get this sort of consciously manufactured awe moment. Hey, yeah, it'll be great. Okay. Well, um, 
I'm sorry about Listen, I, I, well, I, uh, I've been, I've been a little out of line lately. You're entitled to be with your girlfriend, and I guess I got a little bit jealous. Okay? Yeah, well, me too. Okay. Good. Always ending in an on the next arrested development and another setup for a funny, dysfunctional absurdity. These moments are perfectly sentimental enough for the show. It's not every show's job to focus on sort of deep emotional character growth. But if you're into that kind of thing, Schitt's Creek definitely is too. It makes it its job to show us character growth over the span of episodes and seasons. Look at this interview with the cast and imagine the cast of Arrested Development caring about character to this extent. When we started out, Alexis on paper was such a handful and such a, an unpleasant character. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really important to me you know, everyone is a multi-layered person and you're a different person with everyone you're with and, you know, people bring out different aspects of your personality. And so it was really important to me to play Alexis as a fully fleshed out human. Mm -hmm. And that was also part of the casting process, too, because we were we needed that. Right. We didn't want it to be an, a stereotype. And super, I think super, what super Annie fun. inherently brought to the into the room when she auditioned was this like joyful likability and a warmth to the character that we didn't see from anyone else. Mm -hmm. Like it was just abundantly clear that she was the right person to play it because we didn't want the character to go down a path of mm -hmm. I've seen socialites played on TV all the time. <laughs> it was about how do we expose this character for being more than what culture has sort of totally. pinned her to her. be. Mm -hmm. Totally. And I think I think it's um a testament to the to uh, nurture in the nature nurture argument. Um, cause Alexis started out in this environment w that was so deeply superficial and there were so many relationships that weren't sincere at all that brought out, you know, many unlikable qualities in her, mm -hmm. but then you plunk her into this town and take away that toxic environment and you kind of let her real personality and show. Find and when you watch the show, you see it's true that Alexis learns to be more responsible, happy, and free, as does David with his relationship and business. And Johnny and Moira come to terms with how out of touch they've been once it's shoved in their face day in and day out by circumstance. It's clearly the more sort of wholesome show if that's what you're into. Maybe it's because the show Shit's Creek itself is actually a family affair, created by the guy with awesome eyebrows, Eugene Levy, with his son, Dan Levy, and his brother, all as executive producers. Another Levy is in the show, though not also as an executive producer, but just my favorite actor in the show, Sarah Levy, who plays Twyla. We get these insights into the stress, grief, and family issues she's experienced in these absurd, otherworldly asides. They say death is just life, except you're not here. Well, I, I do have a large collection of my grandfather's hospital bracelets. Yum. Um, so where did you learn how to tell fortunes, Toy? Oh, one of my mom's ex-boyfriends was a magician and a gambling addict, but he was also really good at reading tarot cards. He predicted when he was gonna leave my mom, like, to the day. Twyla is the perfect encapsulation of a show that wants its laughs laced with reality as much as its reality laced with laughs. Let's touch on one more difference, so-called political correctness. <laughs> I hate the phrase politically correct because it's an opaque euphemism that's arbitrarily weaponized, but I'm using it here to mean in line with reasonable social conventions and basic human decency. So in this context, politically incorrect would mean pushing the limits of social conventions of basic human decency, and oh boy, Arrested Development really likes to do this. The entire Rita arc is unwatchably ableist in any decent degree of retrospect. And they should have known it. Are you too busy for us? No one's seen you. Going on all those dates with Rita? Or should I say, play dates? Michael had recently dated a woman he later found out was mentally challenged. Infantilizing someone who's disabled is not funny for your information. And let's talk about gender and sex. Why are there regular jokes throughout the series about the gender identities of the people both the lawyer Barry Zuckercorn and Tobias are each attracted to, respectively? I mean, it's funny here and there, maybe, but it gets to be a bit much. The show asks us to laugh at some uncomfortable jokes related to gender identity. Oh god, here she is. Next, that guy. Uh, what guy? That guy. 
No, that's her. Him? That's a girl. I, I think the name Michael is making you look for a man. I think I'm looking at a man. <sighs> Michael. Yes. Yes. No, I meant girl Michael. No, I'm gonna leave you two alone. So nice to meet you, girl Michael. What? FYI, I'm trying to get back into the dating world. Hey, you're not one of those uh, silly men that's dressed like a woman, are you? No, baby, I'm the real thing. Like, oh, ha ha ha, Tobias thinks the person he's dating is a woman, but he's a man, and the lawyer Barry is attracted to men who dress as women. Oh, ha ha ha. Why is that funny? Well, comedy comes from contradiction, right? And the contradiction is between Tobias's expectation of his partner's gender identity and their actual gender identity. And with Barry, the contradiction is between, unfortunately, what the show Arrested Development insists is our expectation, that he doesn't want to have sex with a transvestite man, and the actuality, which is that, hilariously, Oh ha ha, Barry actually has such preference. There's an implicit insult here, and it's beneath a show that claims to be intelligent. And now check out this fun mixture of racial bias plus junky perspective on gender. The little Korean is here, and I don't know what to do with him. At least I think it's a him. You've got to strip them down to next to nothing before you can even tell. I get it. These are jokes. It's funny that she doesn't know the gender of the child she adopted. It shows how out of touch she is. I'm not saying a show shouldn't have such boundary pushing lines, but this show was obsessed with gender identity. You made my day again. <laughs> well, your mom's pretty uh, out there. She's not my mom. But she said you were her daughter. His daughter. That's my dad. That's a dude? And the worst part is, he thinks he's passing. All these jokes add up to an unwanted suggestion that the audience is supposed to care about people's gender and laugh at people's gender. I hate to say, but that's kind of how I see it. I understand if this isn't bigotry or whatever, but it's a piece of the show's overall lack of any coherent positive statement about the decency we should afford to all genders and sexual identities. Schitt's Creek tackles this problem soundly and early on. After Stevie and David hook up, they have this exchange the next day. Up until last night, I was under the impression that you too only drank red wine. I do drink red wine, but I also drink white wine. Oh. And I've been known to sample the occasional rosé. And a couple summers back, I tried a Merlot that used to be a Chardonnay, oh. which got a bit complicated. Okay, yeah, so you're just really open to all wines. I like the wine and not the label. Does that make sense? If you prefer jokes that demonstrate a positive and genuine message about acceptance in this regard, then you may prefer Schitt's Creek. But some people would prefer to watch shows that joke around more than making points. Some people would maybe yawn at scenes about mental health, like this one. What I think is happening here is you're having a panic attack. Oh no, those, those aren't real. Those are a PR spin for celebrity publicists. Trust me, I've known enough celebrities. No, it's absolutely a, a real thing. Uh, tell me, have you had any experiences lately that have caused you stress or anxiety? Uh, well, I went from living in a 2,500 square foot Soho live workspace to a motel room with my sister. Wow. <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> Here's some mental health advice from Dr. Fuke to contrast. Why, Michael? So you can fly away from your feelings. You can keep them bottled up, but they will come out, Michael. Sometimes in the most unexpected... Hey, where the f are my hard-boiled eggs? So, okay, Schitt's Creek aims to be more socially responsible with its representations and the assumptions it makes about the responses of the viewer, and that's something. But obviously that doesn't have to determine your decision. We're gonna wind down here with a head-to-head -head gladiator battle of the characters of the two shows. I get that this actually makes no sense and is stupid, but whatever, life is all about making unjustified comparisons between things, so let's do it. Let's start with the main characters. I think David is the main character on Schitt's 
Schitt's Creek, especially since he's the one with the big romantic arc that actually comes to fruition in the series. On Arrested Development, it's tempting to simply say that Michael is obviously the main character, but I want to overcomplicate it by saying that I also think George Michael is also the main character. And I think we see Michael pass the baton to George Michael throughout the series, which is exemplified by how the show's reboot with season 4 has the intro theme no longer say Michael is holding the family together, but he's just holding himself together. And we see in the later seasons how George Michael lies about his business because his family invests in it without realizing it's fake. He keeps up an illusion to keep the family together, filling in for the role that his dad used to play while his dad literally falls in love with the same woman he's in love with, or was, or something. That uncomfortable romantic trifecta arc is a sort of overt way of showing how Michael and George Michael are both one in the same function of protagonist. And when George Michael punches his dad, it's right as his dad is saying, It's like we're identical twins. It's George Michael fighting back against the show, cramming him and his dad into a single identity. So, which do you prefer? Michael and George Michael, or David? Which do you think is a better protagonist? Which do you think is a better person? Which makes you smile more? Up to you. Next up is Lindsay versus Alexis. Both are superficial socialites at first glance. Lindsay, who's been lied to and neglected by her parents, and Alexis, who's never had to stay still long enough to grow and connect. Who do you like better there? Then we have Lucille versus Moira. Lucille is more brutal, heartless, and cunning, and Moira is more unintentionally neglectful, helplessly dismissive, and sympathetically unsympathetic. Then we have George Sr. versus Johnny, the dads. George Sr., the Machiavellian, empty husk of a conniving patriarch, and Johnny, the awkward, rule-following businessman who needs to relax. Then we have Maybe versus Stevie. They're the cool ones with a sense of reality, maybe with a need to lie to escape her parents and school life, and Stevie more honest and straightforward in her comfortable, gradual growth. And then we have Job versus Roland, both the wild cards, but Job's wildness is from the desperation of wanting to be liked, and Roland's is from the stupidity of not realizing how he may not always be so liked. I don't want to keep going because these are all made up and nonsensical, but I do think there's a shred of sense to them, so hopefully these ramshackle head-to-head -head battles will help you make your decision. So now after watching this, if you've decided Arrested Development is the superior show, because of course there can only be one good show, then subscribe to this channel and watch four videos more. Only four, please don't throw this off. And if you've come to the conclusion that Shit's Creek is the superior show, then please demonstrate that by subscribing, watching three other videos, and then also sharing two of them online. This will be very helpful in advancing science in this necessary direction. And whether you liked either show more, you can both check out the full version of this mashup theme of the show's theme songs that I made for this video on this channel's Patreon behind a paywall. It's a paywall, Michael. What could it cost? $4? And okay. Have a good one. Bye.